make the team look like they see themselves as actually part of a team and that that team is somehow separate from everybody else. So that there's this brotherhood that exists and it's hard to get in and you don't want to leave. And our identity is being part of this, this team where that's where you get the reflections of loyalty, of identity, of unity. That was Tanner Guzzi. And this is the Brendan Carr Podcast. Today's guest is Tanner Guzzi, the author of The Appearance of Power, How Masculinity is Expressed Through Aesthetics. And in this episode, that's what we talk about. We talk about how men communicate through their appearance. Tanner has amazing insight into how we do this, and he gives great concrete examples of people like Donald Trump and Conor McGregor who are using their appearance every day to communicate things about themselves and to get results. Tanner also gives incredible tips for how we can leverage this power for ourselves to get the results that we want. He has tools for people who are just getting started or people who are very skilled, people at his kind of professional level who want to still keep upping their game. I found this whole conversation fascinating, and I think you will too. You know, you've, you've talked about how this style stuff, it can give you a certain power, but is there a way that, that you could kind of outsource this to someone else so that you wouldn't have to put in all the energy and effort that it takes? You know, I guess technically if you really wanted to get lazy about it, you could, but then you lose all the effectiveness of it. Uh, there are plenty of guys who try and do this. There are plenty of businesses that are built around this, whether it's a guy, one of the most common things I hear is, I don't care. I just wear whatever my wife buys for me. Or yeah. there will be guys who will do stuff like, well, I just pay for one of those like subscription boxes that some 22 year old chick that's a designer picks what, what clothes look best for me. And she sends that to me every month. And I do that. The problem with that is it's just as ineffective as letting somebody else speak for you. And it totally, Ooh. it totally negates the idea that clothing is a method of communication and and it basically just whittles it down to this super simplistic idea of I have to I have to put clothes on and I don't want to look like an idiot. Therefore, anything that doesn't make me look like an idiot is equally effective across the board. And that that's an erroneous assumption to even start off with. Yeah. When you put it like that, like it's like letting someone speak for you. I think that gets to a lot of the heart of your book was that men can communicate with their clothing. And I wonder, who do you see doing this well? Who do you think is really communicating with their clothing in the public eye? Well, I think what's so interesting about it is everybody is. And that's what's so funny is it, it's as soon as you start to learn the language, then it's very easy to see what other people are saying with their appearance and with their clothing. And so the men who are doing it really well, whether that's public figures, you know, take somebody whose style is atrocious, irrespective of what you think of him. Somebody as polarizing as Donald Trump. <laughs> He's very intentional with his appearance and he leans into kind of the atrociousness of it as part of his personal brand and even how he juxtaposes that with the fact that he's got like his luxury line and all these kind of things like very very intentional about it somebody else would be somebody like conor mcgregor in the ufc who very much uses his appearance as a status signal as you can't touch me and that's very much contributed to his persona and things like that so obviously when it comes to public figures you could see those things but honestly go to a high school and look at the way that the different cliques and the different groups separate themselves and even those teenage boys are very effective at using things like their clothing to separate who's in tribe, who's ex tribe, who are my people, who do I not want people to think that I associate with, how do I express myself, what's unique about me, all these other variables. Yeah, when you, when you put it like that, then it's it's very easy to see that this is something we've probably been doing maybe on purpose, maybe by accident, our whole lives. We are, we are all communicating. Some maybe. Um, maybe making mistakes, but we're all strongly communicating with our clothing. Absolutely. I mean, you go to any, go, go to the airport or go to the library or the DMV or somewhere else where you have just a high churn of, of, of public people that you can just kind of sit and people watch and tell me that you can't to a pretty good degree of accuracy, make assessments on who these people are, what they like to do, mm -hmm. who they associate with, how much they care about themselves. And it's not just clothing. It's things like their body language, their posture, what kind of physical shape they're in, the way that they interact with people, all these other things that style is one component of their overall presence. But all of those things are methods of communication and the idea that we either can't or that we shouldn't use those as cues to be able to better interact with other people is pretty ridiculous. Yeah, and it's it can be really fine-tuned too. When when I when I start to think about it and look around, 
Like you, you say that this is like learning a language. And I, I really feel like uh, since reading your book, now I look around and I can almost, I, I can see the language in a way that I couldn't before. Like I think of, you know, I, I was active duty military just a few months ago and people would use something as simple as like their Naval Academy ring. Like we would all be wearing a uniform. E- everybody would look basically the same, but some people would have their Naval Academy ring or their boots would be purposefully shined to be gleaming. People were always signaling in these subtle ways even when we thought we all looked the same. It's absolutely um, it's, it's all there when you when you start to learn and look at it. Well, and I love that little subtle things like that. There's such a good example of a way that you take something like a military uniform that is so strict and so regimented and somebody like me who's I've not served in the military and so for me if I were to see 20 different guys all in uniform, all with the same rank, all like the regular kind of indicators of difference that are removed. I would have no idea about who fits in what way or what Mm. the status is amongst them or anything else. But you being somebody who's in that group would be able to distinguish based on those little minute things like what their ring is or how their boots are shined or even things like probably how tight their gig line is or all these other variables (laughs) that for me being X tribe. I don't pick up on any of that nuance for you being in that group. You get it. And you can even speak that language much better than I can because you, you speak that dialect. You understand that, that accent. Yeah. So you, you're saying tribe being like a, like a dialect. Let's, let's kind of, um, let's, let's separate out these things. So you're saying clothing is communication. Mm-hmm. The archetype is the language and the dialect is a tribe. We've talked about communication. We talked about the tribe and, and dialect. What do you mean when you say your archetype is your language? So archetype is an idea. Clearly, this is applicable to so many things beyond just men's style, and I'm not the only one who's used this idea of archetypes. But it's it's so beneficial to be able to think within kind of these broad frameworks as you start to have your eyes open up to the idea that maybe I should care about this stuff and style is included. And one of the things is I've done this over the last decade that I've learned is a big problem is most men – think that in order to have good style, somebody like Tanner is going to tell me that I have to put on a suit, that I have to dress up. You know, we have this kind of false equivalency of good style equals more formal and especially within the suit. And that's certainly not the case at all. Again, look at the military. You're not in suits every day, but your clothing is very much an effective tool of not only communication amongst others within the military, but even your own self-perception and how you see whether or not you've conquered small tasks to get the day started or your self-worth or other things like that, your discipline. And so archetypes are a way to really help kind of get guys into broad general camps as far as what kind of direction you should start moving in towards your style. And so I've broken it down into three and they are a rugged archetype, refined or rakish. And each one of those is based on things like the rugged guys are guys who they thrive by being able to, to exist in the world physically. So whether that's somebody who's, you know, in the military and exists within that hierarchy or guys that are blue collar workers or cowboys or lumberjacks or other people that, that exist physically, the refined archetype is more based on, again, you can even see a lot of this within the military where it's based on understanding social structure structures and status and and how things work in relationship to networks and politics and connections and all these other things and guys who can thrive within those kind of environments and then the third archetype rakish is guys who they understand all of those social units just as much as the refined guys but rather than thriving by playing along they thrive by rebelling and going against the grain so that's where you get stuff like motorcycle clubs or rock stars or uh I mean, a lot of musicians and artists are kind of these iconoclasts who they thrive by being, yeah, by being somebody who's against the grain or kind of more unique as opposed to I fit in and, and excel that way. Yeah. And and specifically with that rakish type, like you talked earlier about Conor McGregor, like how how is he how is he leveraging that idea? Because it would seem if you wanted to sort of rise within a group, you would you would embrace the ideals and you would become the pinnacle of that. But he's very much the the antithesis of what a lot of you know, UFC type guys would normally dress like. Absolutely. And that's actually something that's very much to his advantage. In fact, I use him as an example in the book where uh, we talk about somebody like McGregor in order to be able to have this rakish archetype or this, this kind of iconoclastic approach to your style really work, especially in a very strict aesthetic hierarchy like the UFC. I mean, you've got the the old school pre Conor McGregor stereotypes of like the tap out T-shirts or that like that stereotype exists for a reason. 
then, you know, and because there's this this strict idea of this is what this is what MMA fighters look like. And then you get somebody like McGregor who comes in and one, he's willing to break the rules. But two, the reason that it works is because he's such a good fighter. If he were just some random guy who were maybe like, yeah, you're good enough to be in the in the UFC, but you're not actually like up there and being very good he would look like an idiot for dressing and talking and acting the way he does because his skill set and his mastery doesn't actually correspond with the bravado, with the rakishness, with everything that he's doing to separate himself. But because he is good enough at what he does that he can separate himself as somebody who's high status, he's a master within that particular arena, then he can leverage his appearance and especially his clothing as a way to separate himself even further. Because if you have guys who start to try and dress like him, which some guys are, then what they're clearly doing is saying, I'm a McGregor copycat. And that's a really low status mm. signal for any other guy within that tribe to say something like that and so it's a way for him to say not only can you not even compete with me you can't even dress like me because otherwise you're just going to look like you're trying to be me and what you're then de facto admitting is that i'm so good that you want to be me <laughs> so and then this, this is all about being more powerful how does that make him more powerful when he gets in the ring well, think about what that does from a mental perspective where you go in and, you know, I have no idea what it's like to fight on that level. I've done some amateur boxing and even just seeing my opponent be taller than I am and having a longer reach than I do has an impact. And so knowing that this is somebody who's maybe he's not the best in the world, but he's the biggest name. And that means the crowd is the biggest and you've dealt with his trash talk and everything else. The mental game that that plays and what that does to somebody when they get in the octagon with him, that's a huge impact. Mm, totally. Yeah. That, I mean, the, the intimidation that comes with that. And, and I, I love your, um, your style in real life videos too. Uh, where you, you point out like he, he goes in barely dressed when a normal warrior would go in all covered up. Like it's, it's a very intimidating thing to think that he just he appears like he's untouchable and fearless. Absolutely. Yeah. And he gets to act like that and carry himself like that because up until previous years, he really kind of was. Yeah. And that's that's a huge psychological factor on his opponents. Yeah. So, Tanner, you you're doing this in your own line of work. You want to you want people to know. And there's a lot of I would say a lot of pressure on you to, to always look really sharp because that's that's your line of work. Where do you go for inspiration? That's a fun question. I don't get asked that very often. Um, I pull from – and I think this is one of the reasons why I've actually been able to do this well and, and help out my clients so much because a lot of guys who get into men's style – will they'll niche themselves very specifically where it's like I'm really into suiting and I really mm -hmm. like traditional menswear and so I get good at that or it's like I'm a sneakerhead and I really like streetwear and those kind of things and I personally kind of like all of it and so what I try and do is pull from different cues based on different things that I'm seeing and liking you know there's a guy right now who's style I've really been kind of uh, enjoying trying to figure out how to emulate that into my own style and he's a Arizona based photographer who's like a cowboy, you know, not mm. by any means like a style icon or some like big public figure, but I like what he does. And then I try and look at it and go, okay, this is really good. I like the aesthetic. I like how that even aligns with some of my own, my own ways of living and what I do. How do I take that and tweak that and apply that to myself or even like, how do I take some of my old high school BMX and punk rock days and, and how do I incorporate some of that stuff into what I'm doing? And so I'm always experimenting more based on kind of the principles and looking for people who exemplify those principles as opposed to like, this guy's a quote unquote style icon. I'm just going to copy what his style is. Right. Yeah. Looking at a, at a picture of uh, Ryan Gosling is one that I always, I always see guys going to, they just, you know, they wonder what does Ryan Gosling do? How does he cut his hair? I want to look like that. Right. Which is great if you're just getting started because, you know, it's a, it's a relatively neutral style that still looks it, it still makes most guys look good. You look uh, better put together. You look more handsome. And, you know, going back to your original question, that's the kind of stuff that if you've got a good stylist or a good subscription box or your wife isn't like, you know, making you look cute, she may make you look like Ryan Gosling. But the problem is, is for most men. You'll you'll dress that way and you'll just go, yeah, but I don't feel like myself. I'll feel like I'm playing dress up. And so you need to inject a little bit more of your own personality and your personal taste into what you're doing as opposed to just copycatting somebody else. Yeah, that that's something that, you know, I, I'm obviously not as experienced in this as you, but I see that as being a huge factor. I have, I have a very close friend who uh, he wanted to get a job after college 
and he, he asked me to like give him some like real feedback on what looked good and I said I'll go with you to the store we had a friend a, a girl who had like a good sense of color and things like that she came with us we got him some stuff he looked fantastic he wore it to his interview he looked great he wore it to the first day of work he looked great and then he returned it all because yep. he just hated it. He said it, yep. <laughs> it wasn't right for him. No matter how good he looked, no matter how um, you know much more influential it might have made him, it didn't resonate with him in any way. Yeah, and that's that's super common. You know, I, I in fact a lot of the guys that I bring on as clients are guys who have already had that experience because they know the frustration of putting the time, putting the money into something, and then being told it looks great but feeling like they're they're basically fakes. It almost feels like you're lying to the world around you because on that innate level, you understand that what you're projecting and the story that you're telling, what you're communicating, isn't actually congruent with who you are. And most guys, justifiably, we hate that. Our integrity wants us to re- reject that. And so sadly, rather than rather than actually getting better at aligning what good style and authentic style is, a lot of guys just default back to you. Yeah, it may not look good, but at least I feel authentic. And so they just go back to what they were doing before. Yeah. You used a a word there a couple of times, authentic, that I I think, I think needs to be kind of, kind of pulled apart a little bit because you're talking here on the one hand about leveraging style in a way that might stretch you a little bit and maybe feel a little bit outside of your norm because if, if i were being totally authentic i'd probably wear you know my running shorts in a tank top all day um, right but i'm not going to wear that to uh, an important meeting or something so how, how do you how do you get that fine line between caring and still being authentic where do you where do you tease that out i think about it as kind of like a weightlifting principle of progressive overload where mm-hmm. if you go into the gym every day and all you do is the same thing that you've done every day, yeah, you're going in and you're you're you know going through the motions, but you're not actually making progress. And so authenticity on its level of like, this is totally who I am and this is who I'm comfortable being. I I think that that kind of authenticity is really just an excuse to not have to push yourself outside of your comfort zone, right? So that's mm. the aesthetic equivalent of that would be what you're saying as far as like running shorts and you know and and some sneakers and a and a dingy old t-shirt. It's like, yeah, you may feel normal in this, but it's not actually pushing yourself. The opposite is if you go in and you totally, you know, let's say that, uh, I, you know, I'm working on getting up to a 405 deadlift. And um, if I go in and I decide that I'm going to put five plates on on the bar uh, on either side, you know, that's way beyond what mm-hmm. I can do. And it's totally useless for me to try and lift that weight because that's that's going above and beyond. And it sounds like with your buddy, that's what he did is, you know, the aesthetic equivalent of that where it's like, yeah, you put it on and but it's awful and it doesn't actually resonate. It doesn't work that well. And so it's always just pushing yourself a little bit further outside of your comfort zone, doing a little bit more than what you're comfortable doing. And for a lot of guys, a lot of times what's really hard is being able to distinguish between is this actually wrong or is it just that I'm uncomfortable with this? If your buddy were to wear those same clothes for a month and he were still uncomfortable, then clearly those were bad decisions. But if after a month he had acclimated to it and he were used to it, then you could go, no, this was actually a really good decision. We made some good choices here. Mm. So how, how do you, how do you find that sweet spot then? Uh, A lot of it's experimentation, but a lot of it even more so is being able to understand things like your archetypes, understanding Mm -hmm. what the tribes are that you fit into and what your goals are within them, and then being able to pull from other things like what your personal taste is. Because you can do it and go just blind trial and error, but then you won't really be able to fine tune the process or you waste a ton of time or a ton of energy or even a ton of money. But if you can take this approach, which is what I teach guys, you know, this is what I teach my clients. This is what's laid out for you in the book and stuff like that. As far as you factor in these key variables and then you plug your own unique situation into these variables, then all of a sudden it becomes much simpler to be able to find the balance between this is what I need in order to, you know, leverage and create the best environment with other people around me while at the, still, at the same time still being able to feel like I'm being totally authentic. This is the best version of myself. And I'm even being a little bit aspirational to myself about how I want to look and, and the way that I want to be. Yeah, this, this seems to be the, the artistry of style. And I think a lot of guys get hung up on, on the science of it, like having a shirt collar that goes perfectly with the shape of my jaw and all these very fine points. Why do you, why do you think people get caught up in all those things? 
it's easy to measure that stuff. Mm. You know, when it comes to the science of style, it's very quantifiable. You can look at things like the golden ratio and what proportions are. And, you know, well, I've got arms that are too long and how do I balance that out? Or my, my face shape is, is rounded. So I need to balance that out by wearing a smaller, more pointed collar, those kind of things. It's really easy to put it into neat boxes and even stuff that's not quite as neat, as neat, but it's still to some extent measurable and quantifiable, like color theory and those kind of things. Yeah. It's really easy to get caught up in that. And then I would say the other thing that even contributes to all that is most of the time when guys are wanting to dress better. We already talked about the fallacy of like, I'm just going to dress up and I'm going to get more formal. But the other things that are kind of the really easy things to be able to pinpoint are I need to play with pattern, which only works a certain way. If you understand the way that it works with your body and, or I need to mess around with different variations on color, which also only works according to things like skin tone and stuff like that. And so those are the easiest things to play with. Those are the most recognizable things to play with. But in all of those arenas, you're still just a beginner and you're not actually accomplishing everything that you want to as far as getting that authentic style, being able to to navigate the nuances of how people perceive things. Because, for example, you know, you take the military. If somebody wanted to be unique, it's not like he's going to show up in pink in a pink uniform. <laughs> Right. I hope not. And it's so right. And it's so obvious. And it's such a joke because of how strict the the stat the standards are within within a military unit. But he can wear his Naval Academy ring, you know, and that has nothing to do with pattern or color. It's not measurable. It's not quantifiable. But it is still something that is recognizable as unique, especially when you know what you're looking for. Yeah. Yeah. I can see that for sure. Now, so if if we don't want to just focus on this science of style stuff, if that's it, the kind of the kind of the low hanging fruit, but maybe not where you're going to get um, the most bang for your buck. Where would you say people should start? Um, I would say start start thinking about what you're trying to communicate. You know, we've already hit on this uh, quite a bit as far as the idea that style is communication. But you think about it the same way that you try and learn a language. Are you somebody who really enjoys being articulate and you want to have a big vocabulary and you want to be able to have the right word for the right situation? Mm. You know, it's I, I know the difference between chortle and guffaw and chuckle <laughs> and giggle. and You know what I mean? And you can do that with your clothes where it's like I've got 17 different pocket squares and I know the exact one. Or – you could be somebody that's more along the lines of, I actually would rather be a man that's, you know, a little bit more stoic and muted. And I, and I don't speak that often, but when I do, it's really impactful. And, you know, you get guys who do stuff like that with their closets where they've got maybe 15 items in there that they rotate through, but each piece is so carefully chosen that it works very well with everything else. And it, and it says the exact thing that they want it to. And so that's where starting by even knowing what type of person you are, how you interact with the world, the way that you want to communicate with the world, and then starting to figure out how to translate over, not just how that works with the words that you say, but also the, the things that you put on your body. That's much better than am I a warm or a cool complexion? Mm, yeah. So you, you appear as someone who's who's got that that huge vocabulary for this stuff how did how did you make this journey did you decide i want to i want to be someone who people are going to know as a as a style guru or was it was it more iterative how'd you come to this place so i first kind of got turned on to the importance of all this clear back in like junior high school because my parents said uh, pulled me and my siblings from a regular public school. They put us in a private school where we had to wear a uniform every day. And it was a school that was, you know, a half an hour drive away. And so my friends in the neighborhood didn't go to that same school. My friends that I was, that I was really most invested in didn't. And so they started to tease me about that kind of stuff. Then as I got older, I started getting into things like BMX bikes, snowboards, punk rock music, which, those things are very aesthetically driven. You know, there is very much like you don't you don't shave your head into like a green mohawk because you don't care about <laughs> style. You very much care about what you're projecting and how you look. And so for me, there was this very there was this juxtaposition of this is what I have to look like according to the standards of the school that I attend and my family and even like my religious obligations and things like that versus this is what my identity was as a teenage kid. 
And I started to get really sensitive to this idea that it's like, oh, this stuff probably matters more than most people think. And then that continued on as I started to get out of being in that that punk rock skater kid phase and started to become more professional. But I wasn't dressing that way and people weren't taking me seriously. I was working in in banking and, you know, I had a hard time with clients because I looked like some punk kid. And so it was only as I started to go through kind of multiple phases of this transformation personally that I started to realize its importance. And then that's when I started writing about it. And it was more just honestly, like I started writing about it just because I enjoy writing and I wanted to do like talk radio and that kind of stuff. And this was a way for me to, to sharpen my voice, but I never had any ambition of being like a style guy or turning this into a career. Certainly not 10 years ago when I got it started. So what, what happened next then you, you started working in men's clothing. Well, no, what happened next is the blog started to pick up some momentum and, uh, my wife got pregnant with our first daughter and, uh, I wasn't, even though I had graduated from school, I really didn't have very many prospects as far as good jobs. We both knew that we wanted her to be able to stay home and be a full-time mom. And so it was basically, well, I've got this audience. Maybe I can start trying to make some money off of it. And so I started doing some coaching with it back in 2012. It was enough to make ends meet, which then led to me uh, getting an opportunity to work for a custom suit company. And so getting really like proficient in the technical training about things like fit and drape and and all this other kind of technical stuff. I worked for them for about four years and then I've been now doing this full time and, and helping guys within my own program for the last, last two and a half years. Okay. And with your, your style too, like you, you, I see you taking risks and stuff. Like I've, I've looked at a lot of images of you in the last couple of days in, in prepping for this. And I see you wearing things like, um, you've got a, a really signature ring. You've got that lion ring. Oh, uh huh. I've seen you wear, I think, a, a beaded bracelet with a suit, like maybe even like a like a plaid double breasted suit or something like that, like a, a very bold suit, and then and then a, a much more casual bracelet. How how are you weaving all these things together? Like, what what is the process behind these? What it would seem very sophisticated style decisions. A lot of it is pulling cues from other guys who are guys that I look up to, but a lot of it really is just. I kind of go with my gut and sometimes it's right and sometimes it's really not right at all. And in fact, I had uh, just this last week, I had some fallout on Twitter because one of the things that I've been experimenting with is uh, high-waisted pants, uh, high-waisted trousers and uh. things like that. And it's funny how within kind of like the menswear suiting world – it's actually not that big of a risk and a lot of guys have been doing it since 2015 and honestly I think that was the first time I had a pair of pants with a higher rise made but as I started posting this stuff to Twitter which was a very different audience it's you know my audience there is not guys who are into style the fallout you know the the accusations of Stevie Urkel or you know that's the kind of stuff my <laughs> grandpa wears when he's out golfing and that kind of stuff it was really reminiscent of me for back in you know I remember in 2003 uh, I bought – I couldn't find skinny jeans anywhere because they didn't make them for men and this was only something that really existed in like the skate and the BMX scenes. And so I remember going to the thrift store and buying girl pants because that was the only way that I could find skinny stuff, you know, and the amount of fallback and, and blowback that I got from people on that and the, the, the amount of times I got teased and it's funny to watch over – you know, that was – 15 years ago, 16 years ago to watch how that's actually one that caught on and got a lot of momentum and everything else. But there have been other things that I've tried bandanas or wearing my belt sideways or, you know, other kind of random things that they just, they don't catch on at all. And that's part of my nature. And also part of what I do within the industry where I just look at it and go, eh, I'm willing to embrace a little bit more risk. And unless I have a client who's really like very heavily within that rakish archetype and is also somebody who really enjoys the social risk, for most guys, it's not worth it. Let guys like me, let other guys be the ones who make fools of ourselves but also occasionally get really good wins. Most guys are better off just kind of playing it playing it more simply. Yeah. What is it about about being a man of status that that is reflected in taking these style risks? You said that it's 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 generally the people of status who – are these trendsetters? And, and you've also said in this interview, like you can look back to your high school and I think of my friend, Chris, like Chris was, you know, the best basketball player in school, probably the best athlete all around. Uh, he was very artistic. Like he was in all the advanced art classes, like he could paint and draw and all these things. And he just always seemed to be one step ahead of everybody in what he wore. Like he'd wear something and people would be like, wow, that looks cool. And then a week later, everyone would be wearing it. 
what what mm-hmm. is it about this status and and these fashion risks or style risks that goes together well i think there's a couple of different components i mean the first one very much is kind of this idea of the halo effect where you take take somebody like Kanye West, where mm-hmm. half the time, and you know, you can even almost look at this as like the myth of like the emperor's new clothes, where half the time people do things that really are aesthetically pretty stupid, but because the, somebody of high status does them, and and other people want to be associated with that, it's immediately just adopted as like this is pretty cool. I'm going to do it anyway, you know. So there's one element of it to that, but I think the other element that's even more prominent with it is that. When it comes to status and and the ability to be socially cohesive and you've got – you basically, you have social capital. You have so much built in that you can afford to take a risk and have it not pan out if it doesn't work out. You know, if you're already somebody who's likable, who's already well-respected, who, you know, like your buddy Chris who already has that high school popularity and stuff like that, I'm sure there were a couple times that he wore things that didn't really work out at all. But Mm. nobody really remembers that because he's a cool guy. He's got all this other stuff going for him. It's not that big of a deal. Whereas you take somebody who's just like on the cusp of being accepted or somebody who's even worse, like they're totally an outcast and they don't embrace that identity of being an outcast. They're trying desperately to fit in. Those guys, if they take a risk and it doesn't work, then they crash and burn as a result. So it's almost <laughs> like you have the you have more you have more of that social capital that you that you can kind of get away with some of it burning off just like you know if you if you got a few billion dollars in the bank and you lose a couple hundred thousand on a bad investment not that big of a deal but if you're working a 9 to 5 and you're making 55k a year and you lose a, a few hundred thousand dollars on an investment you're screwed oh yeah the that financial comparison really paints it in in a light that i think is more tangible because we all know that if if you're if you're super wealthy then you can take more risky investments and you may lose more, but every now and then you 10x your money if you're a venture capitalist or something, and it uh, it plays out really well. So you're saying that sort of the influence of clothing, you can also take those small bets, and if you are someone with status, then you can you can take those bets and potentially make greater gains. Is that right. Kinda, well, it, and it's kind of and it's kind of a chicken and egg scenario too, because you don't get to that level of having that kind of social capital without having your own propensity to actually take those kind of risks and take them well enough that they pay off more often than not, at least at the beginning. And so it really is like there's some synergy there between the two as far as what your personality is like, what your tolerance is for social risk or financial risk or anything else, but then also how that's rewarded and then your ability to engage in that same behavior further because you're shielded from the negative consequences and the the positive consequences are actually magnified even more. Mm. Yeah, and and all of this too – there's there's a social aspect and there's very much an aspect of the self that I think some people forget about with with clothes and how how it influences yourself. Like we talked about the halo effect and this this sort of outward sense of, of people seeing you as better looking, more powerful, more impressive. What internal effect can our clothing have on us? I w- and I argue this with my clients, especially as we're getting started, that this is more important than the external effect because. Mm-hmm. Whether we want to admit it or not, the way that we see ourselves, our self-talk, our self-perception and everything else is – is it's massive. The the impact it has on us and our ability to be successful, our ability, our ability to tolerate risk, our ability to, to rebound from disaster, all of that has so much to do with just our own self-perception. And so when you dress in a way that you, based on your own experiences, your archetypes, the things that you're used to seeing as, as positive and good, when you dress in a way that signals things like I'm competent or I'm capable or you know I've got a lot going for me and that is the image that stares back at you in the mirror or when you catch your reflection on a building or in this you know in a car window or something else if that's the thing that's always staring back at you then that's the story you continue to tell yourself again and again and again and you know that this is why you can't just put a guy in a suit and expect that kind of response because maybe the world that he comes from sees suits as a huge negative and oh, yeah. so he's not going to get that positive self reinforcement from seeing that kind of thing it has to be based on those those ideas of archetype tribe personal taste that kind of stuff it has to be those kind of things that give you that positive reinforcement so you see yourself as the kind of man who's actually capable of accomplishing the things that he sets out to do versus every day looking back in the and having the guy that stares back at you in the mirror just being well that's the same dude that i was 15 years ago i haven't made any progress on anything at all or this guy looks like a chump or a bummer he looks like he doesn't care at all yeah it's 
it it's hard to overestimate how much people often put on what we think other people are thinking about us and how that can that can play back into our own perception of self so to to alter that can be huge in how it reflects back on oneself well and especially because you know tying that back into the idea that we were talking about before as far as these guys who can take these big risks and it's usually the high status guys who can do that so much of that is really just they dress in a way that makes them feel even better yeah. and so it creates that positive feedback loop even internally and then that starts to bleed out into their external relationships as well yeah, absolutely. I mean, just just hearing you say this, all kinds of examples come to mind. I mean, I think of the first time I put on my uniform. I think of people who wear superhero T-shirts, which are uh -huh. everywhere right now. Like, but if you look in the mirror and you see a reflection of Captain America in yourself, like that's that's something that's exciting, and, and I see it all the time now. So, yeah, why do you play dress up as a kid? Right, right. Yeah, you put on the the cowboy costume so that you can go out and, and have fun and, and play as the cowboy to get yep. into character. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, it's amazing stuff, Tanner. Um, you you talked in the book too about virtues and and the work of Jack Donovan and stuff. How how does that play into clothing? Well, I think one of the things that happens a lot is that people conflate the idea of clothing and style with things like fashion and beauty, especially because within our generation, especially within the last like fifty years since the sexual revolution and everything, there's this pervasive idea that real men don't care how they look. Therefore, if you do care how you look, you're either effeminate or a wimp or you're or it's really just like the realm of women. And then the problem is is that also means that the way that women care about their style, when it starts to come back into men recognizing it's like, oh no, I actually should care about this stuff. Then they start to care about it the same way that women do. And just like almost everything else in life, men and women are different and we have different relationships. We have different goals with what our clothing should be doing for us. And so the idea of really even understanding things like what what are you valued for as a man? It's not your beauty. It's not your innocence. It's not your your ability to nurture. Those are good things and those, those are all part of being a good person. But you as a man are more valued for things like your courage, your strength, mastery, and honor, which are the, the four tactical virtues that Donovan talks about. And if you can use your clothing to communicate excellency in those four arenas, that's when your style becomes effective as far as treating it as a masculine approach and helping you signal masculine things as opposed to, hey, this makes me look younger or cuter or trendier or more beautiful or more fertile or any of these other <laughs> things that more often than not have to do with with uh, the way that women dress. Right, right. And, uh, you know, and this is something that's been going on. You know, this isn't a modern invention, men, men dressing up. I mean, men have been signaling through their clothing since probably the beginning of time. Forever. Yeah, totally. Yeah, it's one of my uh, my favorite series that I'll do both on Instagram and on Twitter because, again, I'm always surprised by how often I hear real men don't care how they look. And so it's kind of a tongue-in-cheek series that I'll do where I will find paintings or photographs or things like that from different points in history and different men in different cultures who very, very clearly – cared about the way that they looked, you know, go look at ancient, uh, like the Roman gladiators and look at the greaves or the kind of things that they would wear as armor or go look at, uh, the Aborigines and the body. These, these men wouldn't even wear clothes. The climate was so <laughs> ideal that they didn't even have to put clothing on themselves, but they would paint their bodies in a way that would still signal specific things. And it only mattered if you were within that group and you understood what those signals meant, but they still cared. Men have always used our appearance to signal things like status and mastery and strength and courage and, and all these other variables that were actually measured and, and accounted for as men. Yeah. Do you think it can it can even be turned backwards a little bit? I've I have a friend, he he's a he's a software engineer at Google, and he mm -hmm. says that there is a an understanding there, it's kind of implicit that if you dress like a total slob, that you must be some sort of genius and, <laughs> and that you can you can compensate for looking terrible by by being brilliant. Is is there something to playing off of, of this and, and looking goofy at times? Absolutely. I mean, even antipathy for appearance is still 
an emotional response to it. The guys who were truly indifferent to it are the guys who would be just as comfortable in a dress or the example I always use is a pink gorilla suit or in just their underwear or anything else. But the fact that even within a, a, a tribe that really doesn't care or claims to not care, but it's the guy who cares the least is the one who's the genius. Then of course, everybody's going to start signaling that they care less than everybody else. Yeah. And you said it's, it's emotional. Why, why do you think that this topic is so emotional? You know, I, I love that your, your book in many ways is very detached and you point to how these things are, are tools. But I think if you get men talking about clothing, it gets very emotional and very base very quickly. Why, why is it so emotional? Um, I think it's there's a couple of different things to it. One is that as much as we try and remove ourselves from it, we can't. It's tied into our identity. And so when you attack a man for the way he looks, he can't help but feel like you're attacking him at his core based on what his identity is. Because mm. even with these guys who are, you know, real men don't care, if you tell them that they look like they care, then that's a threat to their identity. And they will go out of their way to even more look like they don't care, which is, you know, ironic in and of itself. So I think that there's that component of it too. But then I also think that there's even an element of embarrassment that comes with it because there – when we do – even if it's only just a subconscious recognition, if we recognize that this is something that matters and we're not good at it, it's embarrassing, especially because you've been putting on clothes every day for your life and you will continue to put on clothes <laughs> every day for the rest of your life. How in the world – can you not be good at something that you've done every single day and you will do every single day? And so I think there's that element of kind of embarrassment or it's like, oh, man, I really should know or regret or all these other things. So unfortunately, there's a lot of negative emotion that gets tied into it. And the fact that if you do care about it too much, if you do become somebody who is kind of a dandy or that's all that matters, then even then that's that's dishonorably unmasculine where mm. if all that matters is appearance. And so even – Finding the right balance of caring about it the right amount in and of itself is a skill set that's hard for guys to develop. So there's just a lot of negativity that's kind of baked into everything. And and yeah, I, I would say that that's where most of that emotion comes from. Yeah. So if, if someone's just just listening right now and, and they're just getting past that and they want to they want to make a step, what's what's like step one? What's like the first thing you would say to, to kind of dip your toe in? Uh, wear everything that you have in your closet and pay attention to what it is that you have on that makes you feel the best and what it is that you have on that makes you feel the worst. Start identifying your own kind of emotional responses to things and then pay attention to, you know, is it the color? Is it the fit? Is it pattern? Is it texture? Is it the way that this looks and it actually fits in with what the other guys at work are wearing? Or is it, do I like that it stands out? Or start paying attention to just those little things based on what your emotional responses are. And then you can start seeing about how you replicate the things that work well and getting rid of the things that don't. Wow. I, I love that, that suggestion. I, I thought for sure it was gonna be something like, well, you know, uh, you know, get your, get something tailored up or something and start working on, you know, one aspect of this, but to, to stop and just to look at what you wear and to, to develop a richer awareness that, that makes so much sense. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, I found that that again over the years of working with guys one on one that that's that's the most important thing because if you do a big crazy transformation, then you deal with so much of that negativity that we've already talked about. Whereas if you just take what you already feel authentic in and you just do a better version of it, then not only do you get all those external and interpersonal relationship benefits as far as how other people react to it, but then you really double down on what all those internal benefits are too. And then what's really cool is it doesn't feel like it's a transformation. It just feels like it's an evolution. And so it gets rid of a lot of the shame or the embarrassment. It gets rid of a lot of, hey, looking good today kind of comments <laughs> because you just, you just, you've leveled up as opposed to turn to complete 180. Totally. Totally. Uh, just just a side thing, Tanner. We, we talked a lot about clothing, but I, I think sometimes men will try to signal with, with lots of other objects, particularly um, cars and watches are, yeah. are things I hear guys talking about all the time. And they're, they're very clear that they're like, especially in Southern California, that like the car culture here and wanting to have like a cool whip. Like why, why is that something that people can, can gravitate to more clearly? That's and, a great question. Yeah. Why is it that we can talk about that in a way that, that we can't talk about clothes? I would say that because those have remained in the largely exclusively male space. 
Hmm. You don't have you don't have the majority of women talking about how cool their cars are or geeking out about you know the you know, I'm getting a new Tacoma with a with a killer lift and I can't wait to get the you know the the rack roof in it like there's you know you don't get that versus a sports car or anything else there's not all this tribalism that's built around it for women the same way that there is for men and I would say the same thing for watches where it's like yeah I got this you know I got this new uh, Panerai and it's awesome and I love how big and clunky it is and other guys like no you need a Rolex like a Datejust because it's simple and it's elegant and and yeah where those I would say are still kind of exclusively male spaces so it's it's safer to be able to indulge in your inner aesthetic <laughs> while yeah. while talking about those things whereas clothes are still seen largely as the realm of women yeah this is this is fascinating stuff tanner if people want to find out more about this want to learn more from you uh, where th- where should they look for you online so my main site is masculine-style.com. Um, you'll be able to go there and see articles that, that I've written over the years and especially be able to uh, go take a quiz that will actually tell you which of those three style archetypes is your primary archetype. Um, I'm also very active on both Twitter and Instagram. And both of those you can follow me. It's at Tanner Guzzi. So T-A-N-N-E-R-G-U-Z-Y. And uh, that's where not only do – because I love talking about style stuff, but even more importantly, I love talking about how it relates to masculinity, self-development, self-optimization, and how this is one of many pieces that you need to get dialed in to become the best version of of who you are and who you want to be as a man. Hmm. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Tanner, my my final question is, what can a leader do to make their team appear more powerful? Oh, that's a fun question. Okay, what can a leader do to make his team appear more powerful? I would say the biggest thing is to be able to make the team look like they see themselves as actually part of a team and that that team is somehow separate from everybody else. Mm -hmm. So that there's this brotherhood that exists and it's hard to get in and you don't want to leave. And our identity is being part of this, this team where that's where you get the reflections of loyalty, of identity, of unity, and everything else that comes in with it. And again, you can even see that within the military where, you know, you probably don't see that as much when it comes to squads or battalions or stuff like that. But there's a reason that the army looks different than the Navy, who looks different from the Marines, because from an outside perspective, the differences are not nearly as big as the similarities. But from an inside perspective, those differences are huge, right? Huge. And part of that comes from even things like, no, we don't wear those colors. That's not our dress uniform. They're not us. We're something different. We're something separate. Tanner, that, that is a tremendous, tremendous answer. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. And just uh, like a little nuance too, like even within the Navy, like we, we all have this same sort of like quasi dress uniform. It's like this like perfect in-between uniform that you can wear for lots of things. But if you are in aviation, you wear brown shoes with that uniform. If you were awesome. in the submarines or something like that, you wear black shoes. And like, there's still these little distinguishing marks that we, we play on all the time. So, so true. I hadn't even thought of that before. Thank you so much, Tanner, for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. I've loved the questions. It's been really fun to dive into this stuff. And uh, yeah, I hope, I hope the listeners find it useful. Everybody, that was Tanner Guzzi, author of The Appearance of Power, How Masculinity is Expressed Through Aesthetics. And if you want to help us get more great guests like this on the show, then be sure to subscribe, and we'll catch you next time.